might be quite self-explanatory, but the most important factor is then bat speed at impact, i.e. the faster you swing the bat, the faster the ball's going to go. And there again, 83% of the remaining variation for those central impacts can be explained by bat speed. And this is where it hopefully gets a little bit less intuitive, but maybe a bit more interesting, is we can now look at what biomechanical technique factors allow people to do that. So allow them to swing the bat faster. To do that, we performed a study where we recruited 20 batsmen, ranging from club to, again, senior England internationals. They all performed a series of shots against a bowling machine. Here's a video example from a female participant in another study, but reflective markers stuck to joints all over the participant, including um, on the pads, including on the bat and reflective tape on the ball. And we've then recorded this using 3D motion capture cameras, so Vicon cameras here. And that has allowed us to convert what the players did into a biomechanical model, a 14 segment model of their performance, and therefore get various joint angles and joint angular velocities that we can use to say what technique maximizes bat speed. We measured 28 parameters, so some of them are on the screen now, such as how much front knee extension did they have, um, what was the bat angle, what was their stride length, their downswing duration, etc. And we measured all of these at four time points. The start of the downswing, the start and the end of the forward stride, and at impact as well. So what did we find? The single most important parameter of their technique that explains the variation in bat speed, i.e. why can some people hit the ball, hit the swing the bat faster or slower than others, was something called X-factor, which I know Paul referred to briefly in his talk earlier. That is the separation between the pelvis and the thorax in the transverse plane. Quick recap, transverse plane is that plane through the middle of the body. Essentially, we're taking a bird's eye view and looking down on the batsman. If we draw a line through their pelvis, and a line through their thorax or their chest. As they go to separate and rotate, they, those two lines will separate and form an X. The bigger this X, the faster players will then swing the bat. So we're not simply talking about how far they rotate, it's the separation between the two segments. So how much further the thorax will rotate past the pelvis. And to display that another way, here we've got a red line through the pelvis and a blue line through the thorax, both mapped onto the floor. So it's this mapping onto the floor, looking from above we're interested in. As the ball's released, there's no separation. We then get a separation or an X during the backswing and it recoils and goes the other way during the downswing. No separation, separation, and then recoil. And the more that separation was, the greater the bat's speed. Essentially, this is because it allows batsmen to make more efficient use of the stretch shortening cycle, stretching the active muscles during eccentric loading um, to increase muscular force and power output during the subsequent concentric phase of the downswing. This leads to a faster uncoiling during the downswing. And we found similar separations to previous studies in tennis and baseball and golf. So tennis and baseball, but less than golf, probably because of the timing constraints, which mean um, players in cricket, tennis and baseball are having to respond to an oncoming ball of kind of unknown location and speed rather than having a longer duration for a golf swing. Second most important parameter was how much did they extend their lead elbow? And then finally, how much wrist uncocking was there during the downswing? 
all three parameters together, explaining about two thirds of the variation in technique. With both the elbow and the wrist, um, we're saying not only did these maximize velocity, but extending them also maximizes the length of the bat arm overall system at impact. And a greater range of motion um, gives them more range through which they can accelerate the segment, um, which obviously then leads to increased segmental velocities and essentially bat speeds. What's interesting to me is that the order of importance of the three parameters goes from proximal to distal, i.e. from the centre of the body at the pelvis through to the elbow and then the wrist, getting slightly less important each time. So it's more important to get that initial movement right, which can then transfer through the body. This relates to proximal to distal sequencing or a kinetic chain principle, which generally momentum will build up through the body from say legs, trunk, shoulder, elbow, wrist, in, with the velocity or force increasing slightly each time. And to highlight this another way, um, from our recent study in badminton, I've colour coded the body segments based on their speed. And we can see this sequencing as the player jumps, it goes down the body. And then as they go to swing, it comes back up the body so that they've got maximal racket head speeds just at the exact moment of racket shuttlecock contact. So again, we see pelvis will go first and then the upper arm, forearm and finally the racket. So there are three parameters, again, following that kinetic chain, starting at the pelvis through to the wrist. And so we can now look to answer our first research question, what factors contribute to specifically power hitting performance? Number one, you need to get the timing right so that we get the correct bat angle at impact. And we can also impact the ball close to the sweet spot. But once players are able to get that timing right, the bat speed then becomes the important parameter where we want that kinetic chain starting with pelvis thorax separation through to extending their elbows as much as possible during the downswing and finishing up with a maximum magnitude of wrist uncocking.